Daniels and Abinadi are at the center of the facts that this DA used to indict former President Trump. And now, as Stormy Daniels prepares to testify in this trial, we know that. On the other hand, Abinadi's story over the past few years took a very different turn. The lawyer was convicted on crimes and fraud related to representing Stormy Daniels and other clients. He was hit with a severe 19-year prison sentence in total. He is now incarcerated in California's Terminal Island Federal Correctional Institution. So here's the deal tonight. Avenatti is both central to next week's trial and hard to reach now, even though he was, of course, a media fixture at the height of his work for Stormy Daniels. But since going to prison, as I mentioned, he has not spoken out in an interview about this case until now. So as this first ever trial of a former president begins next week, which was just reaffirmed that scheduled by an appeals court today, as Avenatti is a very newsworthy and legally relevant guest, he is speaking out for the first time from prison on the now historic case he helped ignite. Joining us now by phone is Michael Avenatti, the former lawyer to Stormy Daniels, calling in from the Terminal Island Federal Prison in California. Michael, welcome. Well, it's good to hear your voice, Ari. Uh, it's good to have you. We have a lot of news to get to. Uh, but first, how are you holding up? Well, as, uh, as Elton John once wrote, I'm still standing, Ari. I'm, uh, I'm doing fine. And, uh, you know, to those uh, who were hoping that perhaps this the last few years would, uh, you know, ultimately destroy me. I've got some bad news for him, and that is that it hasn't. Mm. Uh, I'm going to come out of this uh, better and stronger than ever. And, uh, you know, every day I strive to make sure that this does not define me. Uh, I believe this will be ultimately, you know, a chapter in a, in a very long book as opposed to the book. Understood. Uh, and you join us at a very newsworthy time. Uh, some of your lawyering... Uh, led to the exposure of the evidence in this case. Uh, the New York trial now will be Donald Trump's first and possibly only trial this year. Um, how do you assess the strength of the prosecution's case? Well, I think what I'm about to say is going to surprise a lot of people, and that is that, um, you know, I think this is the wrong case at the wrong time, Ari. Um, I, I think that the case is in many ways stale at this juncture. You're talking about conduct that occurred some eight years ago. Uh, I think the uh, fact that it's occurring in state court in New York uh, is a mistake. Uh, and I think that when you are going to uh, potentially deprive tens of millions of Americans uh, of their choice for the presidency of the United States, whether we agree with those folks or not, or regardless of what we may think of Donald Trump, I think it's a mistake to do it based on a case of this nature. Hmm. Um, I, I was hoping, frankly, that uh, there would have been less hand-wringing, uh, less bedwetting, and that the January 6th case would have been filed in a more timely manner. There's no excuse or reason as to why that case could not have been brought in 2021, and it should have been brought in 2021. And had it been brought in 2021, we would not find ourselves in the situation that we're in right now. Now, I know a lot of people have been critical of the United States Supreme Court and uh, as well as the second, uh, not the second, but the D.C. Circuit. Yep. You know, I, I think those complaints are frankly misplaced. And Michael, have you been in touch with D.A. Bragg's office and what specifically in, in evidence or logic uh, do you think is wrong with this case? Well, I'm going to decline to answer as to whether I've been in touch with, you know, either the defense or um, the D.A.'s office. But but let me say this in response to the second part of your question. You know, I, I, I think the, the case has a lot of problems. Now, that, that does not – I don't mean to suggest that that means that Trump will not be convicted, because I think he will be convicted, hmm. because, number, because, number one, he's a criminal defendant, and in our society, I don't believe that criminal defendants generally get a fair shake. In fact, I think that the percentage of convictions demonstrates that, that the deck is stacked decidedly against all criminal defendants, um, number one. Number two, I don't think that he can get a fair trial in New York. 
And to the people who claim that, in fact, he can get a fair trial in New York with a New York jury, I would ask them if they were to sleep, go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow and find out that the case had been moved to Mississippi or Alabama, would they still think that the trial was going to be fair? And I think if they were being honest, they would answer no. So I don't think he can get a fair trial in, in New York. But separate and apart from that, I, I think the case does have problems. I mean, number one, I don't know who the narrator witnesses are going to be in the case. And by that, I mean that, that every case needs to have one or two primary witnesses who tell the story. From my perspective, uh, I surmise that the DA is going to use potentially Michael Cohen or Stormy Daniels for that purpose. Um, and, and I think that has the potential to be a disaster. Uh, Michael Cohen is a, and you know I've never been a fan of, of Michael for various reasons. Um, it, you know, he's, he's a serial liar. He's shown himself to be incapable of telling the truth. Um, you know, his legal acumen leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, let's just say that if, you know, if Learned Hand or Clarence Darrow had a love child, it, it certainly wouldn't be someone like Michael Cohen. Trump claims that he just paid retainer money, um, and now it's being prosecuted as basically financial fraud, lying about the expense. Uh, you have a lot of experience in this case. Is Donald Trump lying when he says it was all going to just be a retainer? Yeah, I, I don't believe that, and I've never believed it. And if you go back and look at the interviews, in fact, that you and I conducted back in 2018, uh, I've always scoffed at that and, and thought it was ridiculous. But my point is one just of trial dynamics. Who's going to tell the story? And the problem is, is that if the prosecution relies predominantly on Michael Cohen and, you know, documents don't admit themselves into evidence, you know, I see various legal commentators talk about, well, this is a document case. Well, that may be true to a certain degree, but you've still got to have somebody on the stand that tells the story. And, and to say that Michael Cohen is a, uh, is a problem witness uh, would be an understatement. I, I mean, and, and look, here's the other issue, Ari. You know, Alina Abba is not going to be trying this case for Donald Trump. Now, I don't know how he got them, but he got real lawyers in this case. And these lawyers know their way around a courtroom. And I think they're going to have an absolute field day with Michael Cohen on the stand. Well, let me ask you so this, then, Michael, because you said some people might be surprised uh, that you, Michael Avenatti, speaking to us today, uh, see all the weakness in this case. I, I do want to remind you that uh, back when you were involved, you said Trump should have liability. You said federal prosecutors in New York should present this material to grand jury for potential indictment of Trump when he was president. Um, so how can you explain uh, going from that then uh, to what you're saying tonight, that you actually think this is a, a, a troubled case? Well, I can explain it this way, Ari, I, and, and you're absolutely right. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in 2018 in October, uh, which predated the criminal investigation into me by about 10 days, coincidentally enough, and I don't believe in coincidences. I wrote that op-ed, and I advocated for the indictment of then-sitting President Donald Trump, and I stand by that 100%. I advocated for federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York to bring campaign finance charges. And by the way, no cogent explanation has ever been provided by anybody as to who made that decision and why they didn't bring those charges either while he was president or immediately thereafter. And I think that's a question that people need to ask. The problem that I have with this case now I have a number of problems. First of all, cases are not like fine red wine, Ari. They don't get better with age. Um, and this case hasn't gotten better with age. Number two, I don't believe this case belongs in state court. And I think it rests on a legally tenuous theory, namely that the crime that was attempted to be covered up was a federal election crime. I think that could be a problem potentially on appeal um, for the state. Um, and number three, and let me slow think, you down and then you'll go to number three. But you're just to be clear, saying that with your knowledge of all of this, if the D.A. is trying to make this stick as a felony, as a serious matter based on a federal rather than state crime, you think that could be a hole in the whole theory of this case? I, I do. And I think it's going to be tested on appeal um, when Trump is convicted. And again, I think he will be convicted. That doesn't necessarily mean um, it's going to hold up. 
I believe if you're going to bring a case against a sitting president or a former president who tens of millions of people support, especially in today's day and age with how divided we are, I think it needs to be a rock-solid, lock-tight, lock nearly perfect prosecuted case, because otherwise you run a huge risk as to what it's going to mean for the country. And I don't believe this case right now is the case. And that's the problem that I have. But I stand behind everything I said in 2018, everything I wrote in that op-ed. Hmm. And, and I remain very concerned that no one has gotten to the bottom of what the hell exactly happened with SD&Y in 2018. Was that decision made by Jeffrey Berman? Was that decision made by William Barr? Who made that decision, and why was it made to turn a blind eye to Donald Trump's yeah. conduct? Well, Michael, you mentioned your history. You also uh, wrote that there are facts and evidence, texts, emails, etc., in the hush money case that have yet to see the light of day that will be, quote, very damaging to the prosecution. Uh, have those since seen the light of day? What are you referring to? Well, I'm, I'm going to be careful about what's been disclosed and, and who it's been disclosed to. Um, I, I don't know, ultimately, uh, if they will see the light of day during the trial. But, you know, Ari, over the course of the representation, my representation of Ms. Daniels, I came to learn a number of things, unfortunately, uh, from her that turned out to be completely untrue. Uh, and a lot of that is what led me to terminate my representation of her in February of, of 2019. One of the big things that I learned, unfortunately, is that what I had been sold by Ms. Daniels relating to how this payment had came about and what I had subsequently advocated on television and others in reliance on what she had told me turned out to be completely false. Uh, it had been represented to me that she had not attempted to extort Donald Trump uh, and the campaign in the waning days of 2016, that they had come to her. Uh, and I believed her when she told me that repeatedly. Unfortunately, in early 2019, I came to learn that that was not true. Does it matter to the legal case who initiated it if, uh, as you said earlier tonight, Donald Trump still lied about it and potentially lied to the government about it? I don't think from a legal perspective it matters, but okay. I think very well from an optics standpoint it could matter. And again, I believe he'll be convicted in the case, but I don't think it's going to move the needle to the degree that some people believe that it will. I think a lot of this is already baked into the analysis relating, for instance, to the campaign. I mean, I've seen the polls and I've seen the, the, the pundits talk about that if he's criminally convicted, it's going to... Uh, it's going to be meaningful as it relates to the presidential election. I don't think that's going to be true if he's convicted in this particular right. case. Let me ask you this, Michael. You've thrown some cold water on what some people thought was a strong case here, and, and you've also given your analysis of what may happen, and we'll all be watching. Uh, at the same time, you have implied that your treatment uh, by the then Barr and Trump Justice Department uh, was harsher than other people may have uh, been dealt with if they weren't in your position. You had become, for a time, a very prominent foe of then-President Trump. Um, do you say tonight that, that there is evidence that you were treated differently? And if so, does that mean anything for what a second-term Trump DOJ might look like if he were elected? I, I don't believe there's any question that I was treated differently. And I believe that if anyone is asked that honestly and looks at what happened here, and if they're honest in their answer, I believe that they would answer the same way that I have, Ari. Uh, I was indicted in three separate cases within 54 days. The government proceeded to stack these sentences on top of one another. I was not treated fairly, and I was treated um, differently. And I firmly believe, and will go to my grave believing, uh, that one of the reasons, the reason I was treated in this fashion was because I was the biggest enemy. Uh, of Donald Trump in 2018. There's no question about that. And I was also his most dangerous enemy. And finally, what do you say to people listening tonight who think, well, even if that's the case and there was differential treatment, uh, you still were caught and at times expressed, uh, you know, contrition uh, for crimes and crimes related to dishonesty. Why should people take your word on any of this tonight? 
Well, because I think I demonstrated over a significant period of time and over a couple decades um, of legal work that I've done a lot of good, uh, that a lot of what I've said has checked out, uh, that I generally have not trafficked in nonsense. There's no question, Ari, that I made mistakes. There's no question uh, that I exercised poor judgment uh, at times. Uh, but there's no question that I exercised poor judgment at times. Uh, but I, I think people need to ask yourself or themselves, are you really going to define somebody by the worst thing they did in their life, or are you going to look at the totality of the body of their work? Mm -hmm. And what advice would you give to anyone and how to make sense of this trial as it unfolds? Well, I, I think it's going to be a circus. It's certainly going to be entertaining, uh, and uh, it, you know, you're going to have your work cut out for you. But from what I've seen, you're certainly going to be, you're certainly going to be up uh, to the task. Uh, and uh, again, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Michael Avenatti, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone, you hit search on the bottom right corner, you type in MSNBC, you click on the MSNBC app, you click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.